I had known Jackie Cork since the first day of kindergarten at Franklin Elementary School. On the first day of school, we were invited to bring a picture that would make us feel better if we became homesick. I brought a picture of my family on my aunt's farm, and throughout the day, I looked longingly at it. I'm not sure if I was actually homesick, or if I was just beginning my flair for the dramatic early in my childhood. <laughs> Jackie, on the other hand, brought a picture of her and her mom making silly faces to the camera. And after recess, we were both looking at our pictures, and she told me, eh, I didn't really need the picture. I'm having a great time. <laughs> it was clear that that was just Jackie, silly and without a care in the world. She seemed to carry that carefree spirit everywhere she went, making new friends, learning in class, and most importantly, befriending the kids who no one else wanted to be with. Yet, somehow maintaining her status as a cool kid that everyone wanted to be around. I do remember sitting on the floor of her bedroom one day when she told me that her parents were divorcing. It may have been the only time that I ever saw this carefree soul weep. She told me of the confusion that she felt and that she didn't even really understand it fully. It may have been my first experience with holding space for another. I'm not sure that my eight-year-old self really knew what was going on, but I just knew that my friend was hurting and I could just sit there and be with her until she was ready to go out and listen to NSYNC or whatever we were listening to or rollerblade in the driveway once again. Jackie and I drifted away slightly in middle school and in high school we ended up in class together. And Jackie was still that goofy carefree friend that I could count on to be there for me through anything. We graduated together, reminiscing on the fact that we began school together 13 years earlier and would go off in our separate ways for college. Jackie and I would often joke that we would end up in the old folks' home together because our paths just continued to cross. Early last year, Jackie was killed in a tragic accident. This wonderful, vibrant, caring person who I had known in my entire life, gone in an instant, 25 years old, and now frozen at 25 for the rest of my life. It's hard to come up with words in a situation like this. And unfortunately, I'm not the only one who has ever experienced a pain like this. As I look around this room, I can imagine your stories, even if I don't even know them. People lose children. Homes are destroyed by fire. Family members are diagnosed with cancer. And we're left wondering, why? Why me? How could God do this to me? Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Jeremiah. And Jeremiah was one of the major prophets from the Hebrew Bible. And his ministry lasted from about 626 BCE until after the fall of Jerusalem. From all accounts, Jeremiah, Jeremiah really experienced both the best and the worst of ancient Israel. Jeremiah tells us this story of a conversation with God early in his ministry. God tells Jeremiah that he had plans for him before he was even born. The statement is such a beautiful image before I shaped you in the womb, I knew all about you. Before you saw the light of day, I had holy plans for you. A prophet to the nations. That's what I had in mind for you. Jeremiah tells God of his fears and his worries, but God tells him, don't worry. I will be there to watch over you. It's a very personal exchange, much like a parent or an older sibling embracing a young boy to go out and use his prophetic voice. And then God goes on to tell him, your job is to pull up and tear down, take apart and demolish, and then start over building and planting. First demolish, and then build and plant. 
We talk a lot around here about the ways we can build and plant and grow, and don't get me wrong, it's an amazing spirit and one that has allowed us to expand programming, look toward a building project, but that's only half of what God is talking about. What are the things we need to leave behind in order to make that new life grow? What are the old comforts that we need to leave behind in order to move into the challenge of the future? It's so much easier to want to fast forward through the pain and the heartache and not give the destruction its proper time. It's so hard to just sit with the taking apart and the demolishing. And how many times are we tempted to tell others when in crisis, everything happens for a reason. It's all a part of God's plan. Do we do that to make others feel better or because it gives us something to say when there really is just nothing to be said? Maybe the real challenge is to sit in the rubble and find God before we move to the replanting. After Jackie died, her Facebook was flooded with condolences and memories and the usual, you're in a better place, this is all a part of God's plan. But honestly, I refuse to believe in a God who would take a 25-year-old woman from her parents, from her potential, from her future, just for some larger purpose. No, things like car accidents and cancer and divorce, those are human, earthly things that unfortunately make us sit in destruction and wonder why and how the good news, even though God isn't the cause of those things, God is there with us. Through the pain and the questioning and the hopelessness, God is not only there with us as we sit in the destruction, but God nudges us to replant and regrow when we're ready. Family Research Council President Tony Perkins' his home was flooded and nearly destroyed in Louisiana last week. The Family Research Council is a pro-marriage and pro-life organization in Washington, D.C. And their vision is a culture in which human life is valued, families flourish, and religious liberty thrives. This flooding came two and a half years after Mr. Perkins was quoted in saying that LGBT rights would inevitably lead to human extinction, alluding to the fact that natural disasters are the direct result of homosexuality. I wonder how Mr. Perkins is feeling right now. <laughs> is he reeling in his hate and blaming gay people for the near loss of his house? Maybe. Is he assuming that God has caused this flood to test him and his faith? Does he buy into the everything happens for a reason mentality? What if, instead of assuming that God caused these terrible floods, Mr. Perkins was able to open up his mind and challenge the hate-filled idea that God caused this flooding to make a point about LGBT people? What if Mr. Perkins evolved his thinking and allowed this flooding to just be a natural human occurrence in which God's presence is known. It's not an easy thing to do. In fact, it's, much hard, it's a much harder reality to face that there just may be no reason why these bad things happen to us. I imagine that any of us in crisis have gone through the blame, and the questions, but God reminds us that they are all a part of the cycle of life and that from that destruction can come new life. In an article I read recently, author Heather Plett writes about what it means to hold space. Holding space means that we are willing to walk alongside another person in whatever journey they're on without judging them, making them feel inadequate, trying to fix them, or trying to impact the outcome. When we hold space for other people, we open our hearts, offer unconditional support, and let go of judgment and control. Though Plett talks about holding space for others, it's also important to remember that 
sometimes we get to hold that space for ourselves. We are reminded to let go of that judgment and that control. And then, when we just can't hold it any longer, God is there, holding us, knowing us, and telling us, I'll be right there looking after you. We get to challenge ourselves not to blame anyone or to blame God for the bad things that happen in our lives. Doesn't mean we don't get to be angry or sad or disappointed, but rather to remember that both the destruction and the rebuilding are important parts of our journey in this life. We can't move on to the replanting until we've pulled out all of the weeds. And though these may be the greatest challenges in our lives, God is there. I'll be right there looking after you. Amen and blessed be. Now I invite you to rise and sing our final hallelujah.